let's go to, I'm gonna leave this here for, for movement. Uh, we got touch, taste, smell, which is your olfactory sense, by the way, and then movement. And I think we can do all of those pretty well. So we'll do probably touch and pain, and then take a break, and I'll do the other ones after. So, touch, the sensation of touch. It's not touch. Okay, first of all, going back to what we learned about neurons and the nervous system before, uh, what exactly is sending my sensation uh, signals, by the way? So yes, my central nervous system and my peripheral nervous system and all those take the information to and from my brain or my thalamus to my brain. Um, but uh, what specifically nervous system has got my sensory information? So my, my sense of touch. Yep, somatic, right, exactly. So talking about my somatic nervous system, here's some of my motor movement and my uh, sensory neurons. So we're talking specifically about those sensory neurons. So um, this is actually, what I'm gonna explain is a little bit different than notes, so you might wanna actually change your notes because they have an updated model which is much better than uh, a year or two ago when I, when I initially made these. So I had to go beyond like that initial textbook um, that they, they, they provided, what is it, Myers, uh, to do this. So. Touch, there's basically three types of touch you can sense. There is temperature. So you're, uh, you're feeling the, the, the heat of the cold. Uh, pressure itself or uh, pain itself. And the pain can be felt uh, either way. If something's too hot or too cold, it actually hurts. Um, Although what's funny is your brain can't really differentiate between the two. So a burn from heat is gonna hurt the same way that a burn from cold is gonna hurt. Because uh, it's the same pain signal. All right, but the, you know, the damage will be different. Um, and then pressure, of course, is just like whether something's touching you or not. And then if you press harder, obviously you're more likely to experience the pain. So the question is why do some temperatures and some pressures not cause pain? Like if I touch my skin or it's, you know, 68 degrees, I'm not like, at least me anyway, I'm not like, oh, I'm freezing, uh, or I'm on fire, or, um, and if you just like, you know, uh, shake someone's hand at a normal grip, I can feel it, but it doesn't hurt. But if I squeeze it real hard, it does hurt. So why is that? That's the real question here. And you won't be able to know from the notes, but I'll just tell you this one. So all of my sense info, whether it's temperature or pressure, and then it's interpreted as either pain or not pain, it's because of a theory called gate theory or gate control theory. That is, but the model's different. At least I think it is. Because when I got this from uh, the Myers textbook a couple years ago, it was a model that was, I don't know, it was underdeveloped because now there's m many better models. It makes more sense now, at least to me. So hopefully it does to you too. So, uh, and I kind of wondered this myself. I was like, well, why do some things, like where's the threshold where your body goes, ouch, as opposed to, all right, that's good. All right, because it's the same thing. Like, again, that doesn't hurt, but if I really squeeze it, then it does hurt. And, you know, if I, if I grab a, a mug that's 90 degrees, it's a little warm, but it's not going to scald me. If it's 140 degrees, it hurts. Like, there's pain, or 170 or whatever, it could burn. Uh, so, like, how does my body differentiate? So, gate control theory is actually how it does this. So, you actually have two um, types of neurons that feel these. And uh, one is going to be... Uh, oriented towards pain, and one's oriented towards just feeling it in general. So you have, and what I'll call them, the symbols, by the way, is this and the et set for this type of neuron, this one's C. But uh, I'll just use, I'll, I'll label them for you so they're more memorable. Uh, innocuous, if you're like, I have no idea what that means. Anybody know what innocuous means? Harmless. Harmless, exactly, harmless. All right, so like uh, if a dog walks up to you and it's just like happy to see you and wagging its tail and you pet it, it's innocuous, not harmful, it's just there. It could be good, it could be not good, whatever, it's not gonna harm you. A dog comes up though, uh, and it's like foaming at the mouth, and it's, it's like biting at you, and it's like, it, it wants to attack you. That would not be innocuous, right? That'd be threatening. Uh, so that would be what you call noxious. Uh, potentially threatening or damaging, at the very least irritating. All right, so innocuous, it's just there. Good, bad, I don't know, but it's just there. Noxious, uh, threatening, damaging, uncomfortable, whatever. All right, so when I experience something, something touches me, whatever it might be, mostly, most of the time, this is the, uh, the pathway that my, um, 
sensory neurons communicate to my brain. So if I get a signal this way, is it gonna be painful? No, this is just the something's touching you right here, or wherever you're being touched, all right? So this is uh, the, the norm, essentially. All right, and both of these, by the way, share the same pathway. So let's say, again, I'm just being touched normally, so my innocuous um, uh, neural pathway is being activated, so it's just my regular touch uh, sensory. This one would be uh, blocked by what's called an inhibitory uh, neural neuron or, or pathway. So what this is doing, is stopping this one and allowing this one. And so on these guys go to the actual neuron that sends the signal, uh, all the way up uh, to my thalamus, you know, through my peripheral nervous system and central nervous system to my thalamus and then to my uh, uh, sensory motor cortex. Right? That's what's perceived. So I'm touched normally, I just, it activates, so the pressure's low, it's acceptable, or the temperature's uh, ideal, it's, it's cool or warm or, or, or moderate, it's not um, threatening to me. It's not too cold so it'll damage me, or too hot it'll damage me. It's not too much pressure that it'll damage me. So my innocuous one goes off, my inhibitory neuron stops the noxious one, which is my pain, essentially, and then this signal goes to the neuron, and on it goes up to my uh, Peripheral, central nervous system, my thalamus, to my cortex, perceived, all right? Got it, so now I know somebody shook my hand because it went through that way, all right? What about the guy that shakes my hand and just squeezes the crap out of it for whatever reason? What's gonna possibly be different? Now that you kind of know what this inhibitory neuron does, it's kind of the gatekeeper, the one that controls which signal goes through, whether it's um, a pain signal, a noxious signal, or innocuous non-pain signal. Uh, what's gonna happen if that guy clamps down on my hand? Right, so what's gonna happen is this inhibitory neuron is actually going to allow this signal to go through to some degree. Obviously, if it's really painful, it lets the whole signal go through. If it's only kind of painful or dull pain, it's only gonna let part of that uh, go through. So only one can really go through here, so what's gonna to happen to the uh, uh, innocuous <coughs> signal of me being uh, touched and it not hurting? Is it gonna still go through the same? No, it'll be either completely stopped or partially stopped, right? Which is why, if somebody does shake your hand, and then all of a sudden they go to the actual vice grip on you, you don't like notice the, uh, the oh yeah, it's touching me. All you go is, all you feel is the, ow, like the, the pain from it, all right? And you maybe afterwards you feel the pain. Because the pressure amount has gotten to the point that your inhibitory neuron's like, whoa, that's too much, blocks off the innocuous, the harmless signal, or at least reduces it, and allows that uh, this is too much, this is painful signal. So, the reason why I have the pain, Morgan. Sure. All right. This is me you can check out. All right, so um, again, if I experience a temperature that's too hot or too cold or a pressure that's too high to the point that it can be damaging, uh, the inhibitory neuron stops the innocuous or reduces it and allows either fully or partially the noxious so that I get that signal for pain. Now, this is a really important evolutionary mechanism because uh, not all life forms have pain. We do, many other animals do. What is our reaction? Wait, first of all, why is pain important? It's annoying as hell. But why is pain actually necessary? Why would I be less likely to live if I didn't experience pain? You have to know what will potentially harm you that maybe to avoid it. Exactly. Uh, and this is evolution's way of doing that. So if I was a creature that was born without any sense of pain, I could do something that would damage me fatally and not know it. Like I could fall backwards and like get on a rock or a stick that's just stabbed me. Right, and I'm bleeding out, but I don't even know it because it doesn't hurt. So I'm just like walking around, oh, I feel kind of drowsy, and then I fall over and bleed to death and die. Right? Or I do something that's uh, on a surface that's too hot, and I damage my skin, I get an infection, and I die. Or, or vice versa with the cold, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, if I can't feel the pain, I don't know what might be life-threatening. All right? So what evolution's kind of done over time is it's the people that have this inhibitory neuron, this pain sense calibrated correctly, are the ones that survive. So ones that don't feel pain, they would die off. Ones that feel 
pain all the time, they also die because they can't do anything because they're always in a state of pain. So we're, we've found that nice middle ground where we're only feeling pain, generally speaking, when it's actually damaging us, whether it's from um, uh, cold or hot, heat, uh, or it's from pressure, or, because uh, I believe it's actually different, a chemical burn too, like acid or bleach, those actually send a slightly different pain signal, but it's the same idea. When something bad is happening, maybe a pressure or temperature or chemical, my body lets me know. This inhibitory neuron stops the innocuous, the harmless, and allows the, the uh, painful. And uh, when I feel pain, like I touch something that's hot, it's very uncomfortable, right? So what is my instant reaction to do? Pull away, right? And that's the whole reason why you have pain. So if you're touching something that is damaging, it could be painful or is putting too much pressure on you to the point that it could go through your skin and hit an organ or it's too hot that it'll burn you, uh, your hand hates it and your brain hates it. Well, actually your brain hates it. Your hand has no idea. Your hand isn't anything. It's just moving. Your brain hates it and it pulls it away from it, right? So that's what pain actually does for you. And that's why these are actually important. Um, so there are some conditions like um, uh, I think MS and others where people's neurons deteriorate and they lose the ability to inhibit the pain signal. So all they're getting all the time is just the pain signal. Uh, or their pain signals respond inappropriately where sometimes they're going off or uh, they're letting part of the pain signal through all the time. Right, so I've got like this dull, constant pain that just doesn't go away and makes my life miserable. Uh, so you can actually have disorders where these neurons aren't working properly or they deteriorate and you're always feeling pain or you feel a dull pain or you feel pain uh, differently. Uh, so all these things can happen, it's just really rare that it does. All right, that's what gate control theory is. So again, you feel things, there's the harmless, there it is, I feel it, and then there's the, oh, now it hurts because it's likely going to damage me. And this inhibitory neuron is the one that decides which signal or how intensely the signal goes through. So does that sort of make sense? Why do they give it the name gatekeeper? Who's the gatekeeper? The, the neural inhibitor. Yeah, the inhibitory neuron, right, the neural inhibitor. Inhibit, by the way, means stop. So this is the one that can stop or partially stop one signal or the other, all right? Do we understand touch and pain then? Okay, cool. Take a break. So that was touch and pain. All right. Oh, and I forgot to mention the neurons, by the way, what they're called are nociceptors, but here you have that in the notes for pain. Okay, um, let's move on to um, olfaction. The smell and uh, taste. I'm gonna kind of do these together because they're very similar. Uh, they both operate in the same way in that they are activated by a certain chemical, which is why certain foods and things taste certain ways, uh, and in different combinations. And that's how you experience kind of both of them a little bit differently, but somewhat similarly. Okay. So in case of uh, olfaction, you've got your nose, your eyes, your head. Oh, your forehead. All right, there's you. And uh, got your brain in here. You got your nose, your nasal cavity. And they're connected. Okay, so this is your nasal cavity. Um, it's, of course, what you're breathing through. Uh, you got your sinuses up there, too. But uh, on the surface of this nasal cavity are a bunch of uh, receptors. So this was going to work just like hormones do, just like uh, neurotransmitters do in that they are basically, I'm gonna use a shape just to make it easier, but they only fit and are activated by certain chemicals. All right, so like when, um, this is actually kind of gross when you think about um, uh, nasty smells, like if you're in the bathroom and all that, but when you're smelling something, it's because the particles of that thing are actually in the air and they're actually coming into and registering by touching uh, the inside of your nose and mouth. That's how you're actually uh, getting it. So you can extend that to the bathroom and understand why that's gross. Um, regardless, those molecules, uh, chemicals that are floating throughout the air, uh, we have receptors that can interpret some of them, not all of them. So there are some things we cannot smell, but they actually do have a smell, it's just we don't have the receptors for those molecules. 
So um, well, I'll get there in a second. So I'm going to use shapes just to make it um, simple, but they're not necessarily shapes. So I've got receptors on the linings of not only my uh, uh, nasal cavity, my olfactory neurons, but I also have them in, in taste buds, which are on my tongue. I'll get to taste in a second, though, but just understand it functions very similarly. So a molecule comes along, whatever the smell might be. It could be strawberries. It could be garbage. It could be um, grass. It could be... I can't think of any smell systems right now. Flowers, whatever it is, they all have distinct smells, right? Like you would smell them and you can almost certainly know what that thing is, right? Does that sound about familiar? Like if I were to give you the scent of a rose or a flower, you'd probably know that it was a flower and not someone's shoe, right? We can we distinguish between those two things. The reason why you can is those molecules float around, and obviously molecules don't look like this, but let's pretend they do. Um, let's say this is a... Uh, the molecules that I'm smelling a rose with. Uh, what they do is they float around in your nasal cavity or for taste in your mouth, gross. And um, they uh, either align with and activate those receptors and tell your brain, hey, this is that thing, this is that smell. Or they uh, hit one that doesn't align with and what happens here? <laughs> Nothing happens, right? It's just like neurotransmitters. If I have a dopamine uh, molecule come across a serotonin receptor, it just hits it, but nothing actually happens, right? So nothing happens in that case. So I've got receptors in there, and um, what they do is when they uh, attach or activate by the molecule, they send a signal through my olfactory neurons to my olfactory bulb, all right? And that sends the signal uh, to my limbic system. And that also does with memory, by the way which is why smell is so directly up to your limbic system, uh, is the sense that is most character characteristically linked with memory. So I can give you a smell, and you'll likely come up with an image uh, or, or something that you associate it with, with memory. Uh, and I, I've experienced this myself. There's this, um, my great-grandma passed away when I was like 10, so it's been, it's been decades at this point, at least two. Um, and every once in a while, she had a very, very distinct perfume. Um, I've only smelled it on um, ladies that were around her age. Nonetheless, it's very distinct. I've only smelled it a couple times in my life. But occasionally, I'll go somewhere. Last time I was at a museum in San Francisco a few years ago, some lady was wearing the exact same perfume. And I'm walking around, and that smell enters my nose, and boom, I'm like instantly taken back to like my great grandma's house, and I instantly think of it. Like, it doesn't matter how many years it's been, you don't even think about or remember what the smell actually smells like, but as soon as it arrives, uh, it's, it is burned in your memory uh, pretty well, and you'll get that. Which is why um, you can, you know, people have scents too, like a certain combination that, that you smell, like whether it's their house, their clothes, or whatever, that it's, or it's them putting it on their house and clothes. Uh, they have those scents, and uh, it, it is very keenly tied to memory. Um, but regardless, that's basically how the process actually works. Um, another add additional layer of complexity, which I don't know if you need to know for the AP test or not, but they can have different combinations of chemicals, which are almost like letters. So depending on which receptors are activated, I could be getting all kinds of different molecules, and your brain kind of interprets it like an alphabet, uh, in that all these different signals come in from these different chemicals, uh, and your brain kind of takes them like a bunch of letters and identifies them uh, with a word. So like if I have, let's say, well salt. I don't know if you can really smell salt, but at least I know the chemical combination of that. It's, uh, it's um, uh, sodium chloride, right? Yes. So I'm not actually necessarily smelling salt. What I'm getting is uh, the signal for the sodium and the, sodium, the signal for the, the chlorine, and they're putting put together to make that combination, which is kind of like a word, uh, and then my brain is identifying that as the smell for salt. All right, so that's kind of how it works. I don't know if you need to know that for the AP test, but just know that's actually how it works because it's not like roses have a specific molecule that has a specific scent. Your body's actually picking up different molecules and the, the combination of them, it, it identifies with a certain smell. All right, because we are all composed of the same uh, molecules as you guys know in elements, it's just in different combinations. So depending on that combination uh, that is activated in your olfactory bulbs, or olfactory neurons and olfactory bulb, uh, your brain will uh, identify what it is you're smelling. It's like, oh, it's these molecules, just like for letters in a word, Therefore, it's this thing, all right? But again, I don't know if you know that. As long as you understand this, though, that these molecules float through the air, they enter your nasal cavity, and they activate uh, certain um, olfactory neurons, 
that goes through the olfactory bulb uh, to your limbic system, and then your brain uh, identifies it. Okay. How come we have, for the most part, human beings, we commonly agree certain things smell good and certain things smell bad? There is some variance, I realize, but for the most part, not many people like the smell of um, uh, rotting, rotting garbage or bathrooms. Most people aren't like, mm, I just love that smell. Why is that? It's like an evolution thing because people that thought it smelled good, they died. Exactly. They right, they didn't avoid those things, right? It's like a disgust reaction. You smell something bad, we all do the same, we pull back. We, for the most part, agree on things that generally smell bad because those are generally dangerous. Like the reason why the trash and the bathroom stuff smells bad is because it's just got a bunch of pathogens and bacteria that would, if we ingest them or got them on our food or hands and wash our hands, it could potentially kill us, and in the past it has. So people that did not like those smells or tastes um, uh, stayed away from those things and lived, and the ones that did not have that displeasure with that smell or that taste, they kept around the thing, and it likely uh, killed them off and stopped them from spreading their offspring. So the uh, actual receptors we get and our perception of those receptors are uh, largely evolutionary, evolutionarily passed on. There is variance, though. There are people that weirdly like smells that most people consider bad uh, or dislike smells that we consider good, but for the most part, you can generally categorize smells uh, among humans pretty, pretty well, and, and there's a good evolutionary explanation for that. All right, cool. So um, any questions about how this works? You'll find that a lot of the mechanisms in the body are, have to deal with rece receiving uh, forms of molecules and being activated by them or not. That's kind of how our brains work. It's kind of like a computer. It's like an input thing. It's like there's no input, then the right thing shows up, and it's like, oh, here's that thing. And then we experience, sense it, and then experience it. All right, that smell. Any questions about smell? Let me ask you this. Why can dogs smell more things than humans? Because they can, by the way. That's how they can track you by smell, but you can't track them by smell. Do they have more receptors? They do. So first of all, they have more receptors. So um, let's say this is the receptor again for like, I don't know, sodium or whatever. Uh, they, we both have them, but dogs just have way more of them. So if there's only a few molecules in the air, maybe they never hit our receptors for that, but dogs have way more. So the chances of them hitting a receptor higher or lower for dogs? Higher, right. So they need a much smaller amount of a smell or particles to actually smell it than we do because they have way more. Uh, receptors. Okay, fair enough. That's why they can smell more intensely than we can. They can track people's smells because as you walk around, you're actually leaving particles of your scent uh, that we humans don't have enough receptors to distinguish, but dogs do. Um, dogs and other animals, though, there's some things they can smell and taste that we can't at all, regardless of the amount of receptors. What's going on there? They just have, <clears throat> they just have receptors for chemicals that we don't have. Exactly. So we don't even have a receptor for those types of chemicals at all. So like it, and, and if, if we only had these three receptor shapes, they're basically experiencing a uh, smell that's like, I don't know, like a trapezoid or something. It's like, we can't smell that because we have nothing that, no receptors that receive that. But dogs do, so they have a scent for it. Whether they like it or not, or what it's like, who knows, uh, but that's how it's actually gonna work. By the way, where do I determine if the smell is uh, good or bad or enjoyable or unenjoyable? Is it, do I determine that here at the receptor level? Where am I determining that? Yeah, that's your perception, right? That's, here is where that's being determined, right? So, activates olfactory neurons, go through the bulb, the limbic system, and that's where you uh, are gonna be perceiving. Okay, taste is almost, almost identical uh, as far as the mechanisms. So instead of dealing with olfactory neurons and olfactory bulbs, I'm dealing with taste buds. So on your tongue, uh, you actually have a bunch of little um, taste buds with pores in it and they have similar receptors to this. But, so far as we know, there's only five types of taste receptors, all right? And the uh, degree at which you experience these, like some people can't um, stand these tastes because they're too intense or they barely taste them at all, depends on how many of those receptors you have. So there's, there's five kinds. There's receptors for sour, for bitter, for salty, for sweet, and the one nobody ever gets, umami. That one is like an earthy flavor. Like if you have sprouts or um, something that's uh, very green, um, uh, that's the kind of umami flavor uh, that goes along with it. Uh, most people know the other four though. 
So basically, if you zoom in on a taste bud and the pores inside of it, you have these receptors for uh, these five um, uh, flavors, all right? And uh, depending on what it is, uh, it fits in that slot and the exact same process occurs. It's, it fires off or initiates that neural impulse and it goes on up into your brain, all right? So it's the exact same issue. So depending on uh, what receptors I have and how many of them, I might be really sensitive to a certain type of flavor or uh, not very sensitive to it. Whether I like it or not is my perception, but how intensely I experience it, that's really going to determine how many um, uh, receptors I have. So me, for example, I'm super, super sensitive to uh, sour, uh, and I'm super sensitive to sweet. Uh, I'm not very sensitive to, uh, to the other ones, or at least not nearly as much. So like if I have, uh, for example, one of the fav my favorite things to have when I was a kid was um, those, uh, um, damn it, what are they called? Warheads. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. So that's like both. Uh, so for me, I really like those because I get the sour. I'd be like, ooh, that's really sour for you know a little second. I got it really intensely. Uh, and then I would get the, the sweet, which I also experience very intensely. So like, I mean, I don't like just love eating sour things all the time, but I do enjoy it temporarily. And I really like sweet foods. So my wife always makes fun of me because almost all my foods are sweets, although I'm changing that. Uh, but they've pretty much always been those categories. My wife's different though. She likes sweets, I suppose, but not nearly as much as I do. Uh, she really likes the umami flavor stuff, so she likes um, things that are earthy, whereas I don't quite as much like those. Like she likes sprouts and greens, and I, I don't like vegetables, um, because that is what, that's mostly what the umami flavor is, and I, I don't like it. And so I like fruits though, because they're they're sweet, um, uh, and I actually do like salty, but I, I don't think I'm sensitive to it. But yeah, that's what's going on. So again, those you eat the food, and those particles are uh, touching your tongue. They go into the pores and they are activating uh, these receptors. So if I'm eating something sour, obviously it's going to activate my sour receptors and my body goes, whoo, that is sour. Uh, or if it's um, an earthy thing, umami flavor, it's gonna activate those receptors and that's how my brain interprets it. Um, one thing I will say about taste that makes it a little different is it's not purely this. Because actually, if you're eating something, <coughs> smell has to do with your perception of that thing as well. So I could be eating something that smells bad but tastes good. Anybody ever experienced that? I have. I've had that with like um, certain types of cheese where I'm like, I'll smell like, oh. And then when I actually have it on something, I was like, oh, it's actually pretty good. Uh, they actually intermingle a bit. Um, so your smell can affect how much you enjoy something, the taste of it, but also your... Um, understanding of the item itself. So for example, um, if I gave you this chocolate covered thing and you ate it and it was kind of crunchy, like, oh, that's pretty good. All right, what was that? And I told you it was roasted cockroach. Um, it would probably affect how that tasted to you afterwards. All right, so people that are in other parts of the world that eat things that are, uh, to us, sound gross, will actually not enjoy the taste of them. We'll actually like get nauseous um, but they, you know, people who are not like opposed to them mentally, uh, don't experience that. So taste is kind of different. It's not just taste entirely, although it is definitely a major element, but smell is incorporated with your uh, perception of taste, as well as your knowledge of the item that you're eating. What about spicy foods? Uh, spicy is actually just a burn you're experiencing. It's, it's, a, it's a chemical burn. So that's why if you have spicy foods, you're more likely to get uh, heartburn, because it's actually you are ingesting acidic molecules that are actually stimulating pain in your tongue and or mouth. So, yeah. So that's, spicy is not a taste? No, it's not a flavor. It's a sensation. It's, a, it's, technically, it's technically a chemical burn. You're experiencing acidity. Um, so some people like it. It's, it's more mild. Some people like me, I, I can't stand it. It just ruins everything I'm eating. But it's something that's actually spicy and it lingers. I'm just like, ah, oh, and I can't even enjoy what I'm eating. You know, I've, I've had a couple things that are mild that it, it kind of enhances the flavor a little bit, but uh, it's not itself a perceived taste. You're actually experiencing the pain of a chemical burn. So um, yeah. try using that with your parents. Like, mom, can you pass the chemical burn sauce and just things like that? <clears throat> See what they do. But anyways, um, any questions about taste? All right, cool. So they do function quite similarly. I, hopefully you realize that. Different chemicals activate different neurons, and that's how you experience the flavors. Okay, last one. 
is movement, kinesthesia, vestibular sense. This one's pretty easy too because it's very much like um, hearing. It's in your ear. Um, vestibular sense or kinesthesia is your sense of balance and body control. Um, so that's why we don't really call it a sense, but um, it is definitely important uh, and it is something you experience, so you could, I guess, call it a sense. All of the other senses are you external stimuli coming in and you're interpreting it. The difference here is uh, with vestibular sense, it's not external stimuli, it's actually you sensing yourself. All right, so for vision, audition, uh, olfaction, taste, and touch, while I can perceive them with my own brain, uh, if they're actually being stimulated, it's because something on the outside is touching me or molecules are coming into my mouth and nose and I'm picking up on them or sound waves or light waves are coming in and my, my, my body's picking on all, all of them up. So that's what makes those five senses common. The vestibular is different though. Is there any external light source or molecule that determines my balance sense? So I know I'm standing upright, correct? If you turned the lights off, would I all of a sudden be like, oh, and then fall over? No. no. If you yelled, yelled something at me, well, I guess you could like scare me potentially, but if you, if you just use different frequencies, would I all of a sudden feel out of balance and fall over? Mm -hmm. No. Nope. If you, uh, if you uh, put a different smell uh, or taste, I realize I can get nauseous and things if you give me something gross, but um, for the most part, you can't give me a, 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 an item of food or a smell and then make me feel off balance, correct? Can you, uh, um, you could push me over, I, I, I would say, but could you um, stimulate me via touch and make me feel like I'm dizzy and gonna fall over? No. So no, nothing external makes me feel dizzy, uh, correct, as far, as far as you know. You can actually, by the way, trick your vision to make you feel dizzy. Like you can watch things that spin and all that and you'll, and you'll feel dizzy. That's just your perception. Uh, but my actual, um, body sense, so far as I'm, if I'm upright or not, um, if I'm standing up straight, if I'm laying down, uh, that I don't need external stimuli for that. I'm actually gauging my own body in that case. So what it, the way it works is it's actually part of um, your ear, your inner ear. These are called vestibular sacs. All right? And they function just like a cochlea in that they've got fluid in them. Okay. The way my body knows if I'm upright or not, if I'm balanced or not, if I'm laying down, uh, if I'm standing up straight, if I'm sitting, if I'm crouched over, uh, I can actually sense that, right? So like if somebody does come and, and, and push me from the back, uh, why do I usually not fall? So they push me, what, what does my body automatically do? Yeah, your foot or your hand or something goes forward to stop you from falling, correct? How does my body know that I'm falling? Because the water is shaking. Exactly. It shakes the water in there, essentially, is what it's doing. All right, so what this does is my vestibular sacs are, are filled with fluid, and uh, they've got hairs on the inside of them, just like the cochlea. And this allows me to know if I'm uh, upright or laying down uh, or whatever, or if I'm falling off balance. This is what activates uh, in my mind, well, in my ear, first of all, and then to my mind, and lets me know if I'm falling or off balance or, or whatever. And it does that. When the fluid is touching a hair, it stimulates it. So my body knows that I'm uh, standing upright in this case. What would happen here if I uh, was tilted backwards? What would happen inside my ear? What would happen to the fluid here in my vestibular sac? Um, the fluid would move. Yeah, well, it would do both. It would go forwards and backwards. So if I zoom in on one ventricle here, I'm going to zoom in like on this part right here. So I zoomed in, and there's all the hairs here. And I got my fluid. This is me standing up straight, all right? What if I lay down? What would happen? It would go this way. Yeah, it would go this way, right? So what would happen is the fluid would shift, and it would be, if you can imagine flipping this, it would turn into something like this. That's me laying perfectly flat perpendicular. So the reason why I know that is 
which hairs are being stimulated. So if all these are being stimulated, none of these are being stimulated, my brain automatically knows that I'm like this. All right, if I stand straight up, and, and it's, the fluid's like this, and these are all stimulated, and these are all stimulated, and these aren't, my body knows I'm standing straight up. If I tilt just a little bit forward, the fluid's gonna go like this. And now, these are stimulated, these aren't, those aren't stimulated, and these are. And that's how my body gauges um, if I'm off balance or not. It's just like if you took a cup of water and started tilting it. Does the water move? I mean, oh, the water does technically move. But if you do it slowly, does the water really move? No, it really just changes um, it's which part of the glass it's touching, essentially. So the water kind of stays flat if you're doing it slowly, but it different, touches different parts of the glass. All right, so that's kind of roughly how your vestibular sense works. So you've got this uh, fluid in your ears, and uh, depending on which uh, parts of the uh, uh, interior of your vestibular sac it's stimulating, your body actually knows if it's upright or not. And you can fool this. How could I fool this? How could I make somebody dizzy? Well, actually, you know, spin somebody around a bunch. If I, if I took you up here and I blindfolded you, or I didn't even have to blindfold you, if I just spun you around on a chair a bunch and I told you to walk, why can't you walk very well? Yeah, the, the fluid has no idea which way you're, you are or not. So your body doesn't know how to stabilize, all right? Because what you're doing is you're stabilizing. If someone pushes you, it jostles the fluid, and you catch yourself to stabilize. If you spin somebody around a bunch that just throws the fluid around, uh, and, it, and it scrambles the information for your brain, your brain doesn't know which way you're, you are. If you're standing up or you're down, and it doesn't know how to stabilize, and you feel wobbly because your body doesn't know uh, where, where it actually is in space. Even though you can see you're standing up, these um, uh, hairs are being stimulated, so it's tricking your brain into uh, not knowing if you're standing up straight or not, right? But it, if, if you wait and your fluid resettles and your body um, normalizes the uh, signals, then it figures out that you know, you're not uh, flying around in circles, that you're standing straight up or, or laying down or whatever it might be, all right? So that's roughly how your vestibular sac works and how your uh, vestibular sense works, all right? So again, do I need external stimuli for this? Is there a light source or a sound wave or a, or a, or a, a molecule coming in activating a receptor? No, no. All I, I'm only basing this off of the fluid in my ear and what level it is, which part of my uh, ventricle sac it's touching. Right? So that's why it's not added to conventional senses because all the five senses we talk about, it's external stimuli coming in that we're sensing. This is internal. Right, I don't get it from any other source. I get it from my position. And uh, if uh, the fluid is jostled, that is what's going to shake my sense of uh, balance or not. All right. Um, some people, when they uh, are off balanced, the signals coming in make them feel nauseous. Like those are the ones that can't ride roller coasters, the ones that can't spin on, um, uh, on like those, you know, like they always used to have uh, those, those big tires at parks and you could like spin your friends on them. Or like the, is it, it's kind of like a merry-go-round, like those things you can like hold onto the bars and spin your friends on really fast that people always end up flying off of at some point. Um, those, some people get nauseous from this jostling around. Some people don't. Like my cousin, you could spin her for days and she'd hop off and be like, hey, what's up? And then she might be dizzy, but she wouldn't be nauseous. You spin me around on one of those things for a while, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna have, at least have a headache for a while. Uh, and I might feel nauseous. Like, I'm the one that goes on the teacups at Disneyland, and I'm like, hey, let's not spin this thing. Let's just kind of sit here and, and watch it go around. And then my cousin's over there, like, you know, <laughs> spinning as much as she can. Um, but you can actually take medication, uh, like Dramamine. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure how it works, but for whatever reason, you're still getting the signals that you're off balance, but it somehow, in your brain, changes your percep perception, so you don't feel nauseous. So when I go to theme parks, um, I didn't have to when I was younger, but when I got on my tour, for some reason I did. When I go to theme parks that have roller coasters, those can give me headaches, but if I take Dramamine, they don't. And the Dramamine allows me to uh, go on the teacups and, and actually enjoy them for spinning uh, without feeling terrible for two hours afterwards. But yeah. Motion sickness? Yes, that's what motion sickness is. You're feeling nauseous because of this jostling of the fluid in your equilibrium. Um, and some people experience nausea, some people don't. I do, my cousin doesn't. Oh, so like... 
Is it the same thing as if you were to like be laying down for a while and then when you get back up? Yeah, and then you're like, whoa, and you kind of light, lightheaded. Well, lightheadedness, I think you're actually describing because there's a, uh, the blood is pooled all in one part of it and you stand up and it kind of drains quickly. Uh, that's part of it. But yeah, it is part of this vestibular sense too in that you kind of jostled it or too quickly uh, moved it so it hasn't had time to adjust and register like what your actual degree of levelness is. All right, you guys understand the five senses and then the one extra one? All right, pack it up.